full house. This is exciting. OK. So thank you, everyone, for being here. We're excited to chat about AI and sort of how it's going to impact how people do things in the future. I'm really excited to be here with Havanas, CEO and co-founder of Pixar. Welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. So to get us started, can you give us a little bit of an introduction of Pixar? I know it's a hugely, hugely popular app, but not everyone might know about it. OK, before I start, maybe I can have a, like, a quick survey. How many of you know Pixar? OK. All right. Large group. So, so let me explain for those people who don't know. Uh, so Pixar is a uh, wildly popular app. It's uh, installed over 1.2 billion times uh, and used by over 150 million users every month. So every month, we are creating about 1 billion edits on our platform. So 1 billion times, we are creating a content on our platform. And it's used everywhere. We have like every country in the world uh, on our platform. And it's very you know, powerful, all-in-one photo, video, and design tool uh, created for everyone to use and create an amazing content. Also, for the sake of today's discussion, I am also a former AI scientist. I was doing AI back in the 90s when, when AI was not cool. So I was very early in AI. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited about the whole progress we are doing now with AI. So. so I'd love to hear a little bit about Pixar's journey into having AI integrated in it. Because I remember in 2014, when I wrote about the app, it was all about the community features and sharing with people. And now it's a lot more about AI. So what's the journey? Yeah, and thank you for asking. We've been in there. Yeah. Uh, you, you, we, we talked when it was uh, 2014, 2015. And yes, we were building the community and tools. but. Because of my former AI things, I was very much watching the AI progress. And actually, we launched our first AI feature back in 2017. What was and I was pitching to my board, saying, OK, we are going to be AI first company, 2017. And they think I'm crazy. <laughs> uh, so the tool, first tool was like AI filters. If you remember, if you remember Prisma, you know, they are like first or second to launch this AI tool. Uh, which allowed to take an image and create a, like a styled version of it using AI. So that was first uh, features. And since that, we introduced lots of other features, like remove background, upscaling, uh, different filters, et cetera. So make your image more like cartoonish, et cetera. And one year ago, exactly around this time at Web Summit, we also introduced our, one of the first text-to-image tools, which allowed to create, you know, like everybody knows that, when we introduced that, we were like one of the, maybe we were like one of the companies which do that kind of things. And now like everybody is talking about AI. So it's interesting. I just counted like in every talk, there's like at least, if you didn't say AI like 10 times within 10 minutes, you're probably not really important. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of things. Uh, so yeah, uh, that was a, you know, very much like a history of like building AI features because I see this as such an important tool to empower creators on our platform. So a lot of people use Pixar for fun to create or edit images, maybe for their social media or like whatever else they're doing. But also a lot of people are using it for business purposes. Yeah. Did you always know that it was going to be really popular for business purposes? Or is that something that kind of organically came up at some point? Uh, OK, just to tell the story about why we created Pixar, uh, why I created Pixar. I created Pixar because of my daughter. I want to empower her. Uh, she was 10 years old when I started. I want to empower her. I want to create a tool which she can use to create something amazing and be in a very positive environment with similar people. When I also see like, her like, growing and using this tool more and more, I see like, this generation are very entrepreneurial. So when I was a kid, you know, I was thinking, look, like, how can I can find a good job, a highly paid job, etc. Teenagers today thinking how they will start a company, how they will start a business. So that's kind of very entrepreneurial kind of a, a generation. And I see my mission is to empower this generation, and not only to create, but also create for purpose. So uh, we see a lot of cases when 
you know, kids start because of the fun. It's interesting, it's cool, you create the memes, you create, you know, some, you know, entertaining things you put on our social media to create virality. But we're also creating a journey from fun to like a purpose, like a business. Uh, it could be like a very tiny business, like selling t-shirts on Etsy store or eBay. But it's something which is kind of like, a, you know, good for side hustling, etc. So to, uh, you know, fun, we're actually helping uh, teenagers to become more and more creative, more and more professional, actually build something very useful. So yesterday we did another panel, and you said something that was very interesting to me, which is that when initially PixArt was rolling out its AI features, you guys anticipated that users were just going to immediately embrace them, be very excited, and use the features. And that's not what happened. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. So we have a large user base. They already kind of used the existing tools. They use kind of like existing kind of features, et cetera. So when we introduced AI, actually, we introduced very early. And we thought you know, that would be you know, immediate hit on our platform. But it took a while. I mean, it, we see now we think exponential growth. What we didn't understand, there's a, <clears throat> certainly an iner inertia. Uh, there's a certain lag between like, when you introduce a very cool feature and when people understand the value of it. So you need to really like, keep educating about the value. You should show the examples. They should collaborate. They should share the knowledge. And ultimately, it became like, an, such an important tool. Right? Oh, we already generated 1 billion images using AI on our platform. So I'm talking billions all the time. Sorry about that. But you know, that's true. We are uh, such a massive platform that we're really like, kind of like feeling the, all the trends on our platform. And we're seeing like the, you know, people are start using uh, tools more and more. And one interesting fact that 70% of people uh, using our, our AI tools, they actually end up editing it. So they are not like a, making like final content and they're posting it on the social network. They're starting with AI, but then continue editing. I think uh, you know, their own personality, their own kind of aesthetics, uh, like applying filters, cropping, adding another image, making a collage, uh, removing background, adding their background, uh, using our replace tool. So you replace this object with that object. So this is a very, very powerful process. It's, and, and it very much fits our mission. We want AI to be a co-pilot in the creativity, so unlock their creativity even more, because now they can do much more with much less previous experience. Did you, was that surprising? Did you anticipate that people would use AI to, to do the editing after the initial product? Yeah, it's a kind of like very unique to Pixar. I think, you know, if people are using Midjourney, they're just using it and creating and sharing. Uh, what we see is, you know, our users are really wants to be creative. They should, you know, have your own, their own personality and uh, express themselves in the, uh, through the, through the uh, creations. So that's, you know, uh, I think it's not surprising. I would expect, but we are pleasantly, you know, get this confirmation that our users are really creative and they really love to create uh, their own, uh, their own uh, images and videos, etc. So what do all these trends that you've observed in your user base, what does that tell us about the future of visual creativity? So lots of discussions, right? And you know, we talk about, like, is it going to take our jobs? Is it like, yeah, it is. I mean, it's a very, very powerful technology. I am comparing it with uh, electricity. So when you get electricity, it's going to empower lots of new machines, new processes, new tools. Uh, so yeah, and then some people are going to use this opportunity, and some people are going to really use the old school kind of things. And I'm not talking only designers, uh, engineers, like software engineers in particular. I am also like a you know, software engineer by background. Uh, so I see like a tremendous impact on the software productivity. And again, like we need to explain uh, everybody that 
yeah, you need to start learning this new way of doing. If you didn't learn today how to use this technology, you're going to miss out tomorrow because that's why you became less and less competitive uh, because the people who learn, they will be much more productive and then you are going to be you know, losing the competition to these people, not to AI. Mm -hmm. So my message to you, look at AI as a co-pilot, as an assistant, not as a competition. It's a, it's a, the, the, I think it's a pretty stupid to fight with the technology if it exists. It's better to embrace this technology and use it to your benefit. Do you think that it's going to take the jobs of illustrators, graphic designers? You know, I mean, I, you know, I am a little bit biased because my daughter is she's an artist too, and I really want her to keep her like a passion and be an artist, etc. So my take is, you know, we need to make sure that we are not killing this, you know, real artist jobs. And that's why, for example, we're actually encouraging not to use living artist name in our prompts. Okay. So when we say, okay, you know, you know our attempts to say, we're going to move even further with that. So actually trying to be more restrictive to use living artist names, etc., in prompts. Uh, so yes. Uh, that's why my purpose, I see, it's not like a create an art, but more, more pragmatic. So how we can help businesses, how we can use startups can use our product. So the, I, I believe we have some, you know, many startup founders here in this room. So the, I see them as our users. So I see their marketing people to use our product. I see solo operators to use our product. Not necessarily like new generation of Picassos, because I really think they should really go and use like a, you know, a traditional you know, kind of uh, techniques to, to draw, even if they can use AI to, for inspiration and ideation things. So I'm trying to separate these two things. You know? So art, I will leave to artists, even if we just provide some additional inspiration and tools or whatever, I am really focusing on uh, practical implications of creativity for a, for a purpose, for, for business, for productivity, for better design, for better marketing, for better presentation. So this is like what was just, you know, keep me uh, excited about Pixar. You mentioned, uh, you know, living artists and prompts. Bigger picture, what is your opinion on the whole um, question around whether large language models should be used, or should be trained on other artists' work. Is that fair? Should they be compensated? Is it fair use? Yeah, so there are lots of aspects of ethical use of AI. And, and the, so my key, and, and there's, there are lots of problems we need, we need to understand. I think the way we should think about ethical use, uh, we should, you know, you know, we should talk less about technology itself. We should, we should start talking about applications. I think the unethical use of AI, not because of the technology is ethical or unethical, it's like electricity. It cannot be ethical or unethical, it's just a technology. But to use the electricity to make a harm, that's unethical use for, uh, for the technology. So the same thing, the thing here. I think what we should really focus on you know, who is using this technology and for what? It's already there, we cannot undo it, we cannot uninvent it. So, and it's already like trained, whatever. So now we should really look at that, what, what, you know, can we control the prompt? Can we just, you know, make sure people don't use the, you know, uh, brand names or living artist names in the prompt? What are we generating? Should, can we check for safety of the generated stuff? Can we, you know, make sure that you're not creating something which is you know, damaging other people, or you're stealing uh, money with this, or making another crime. So I think that's what we should be more and more focused about. You know, the the technology is so such a powerful thing. It has a bright side, it has a dark side. Like every technology, like internet, like computers, every technology. So we should focus. Okay, the dark use of this technology, and say, okay, we should you know, add more and more regulations about how you should not use this technology, okay? And that will be very good for companies like us, so we know clearly, guide, like, you know, understanding that we can use here, and it will be allowed, and it's, a guide, you know, it's, a, it's beneficial to our humanity to use that way. 
Interesting. And so how has that impacted the way you guys are building out your AI features? Are you being more selective on the models that you're introducing and partnering with? You want some water? <laughs> Thank you. Such a great speaker. <laughs> Full service. Yes. Uh, it's a funny story. I just, you know, I think, you know, what, like, let's take electricity, right? We know that when you produce electricity, you are burning charcoal or whatever. You know, you're damaging your environment. But we know this is a problem, and actually we are moving to clean energy. So we're setting a roadmap to move to the clean energy to use it, uh, you know, like a, a way to produce electricity. So here as well, I think we are gradually moving to cleaner and cleaner data sets. And ultimately, I think we are going to have a much clean data sets, which will be like completely, you know, uh, uh, free from these all copyright materials, etc. I don't think companies doing this willingly. It's just that they have like six billion images or seven billion images to train. It's very hard to really like pick the copyright content and remove it from the training set. They will be happy to do that, by the way. Some of these companies. Uh, so it's a kind of a process. We, we now have a like roadmap to. to move to the clean data sets to remove all these elements and using more and more synthetic content for a training. So basically, yes, after some period of time, we are going to see much cleaner data sets, much more powerful, right, and much more opportunities to create. Not an art, actually, yes. Uh, that's what I, I, I have very much in mind. It's our model, my, at least the models we are creating, are not really like art-focused. We are really focusing on like stock images creation, creating images for advertisement, creating images for you know like a poster, creating images, which is completely different kind of uh, game. Let's do a little bit of audience participation. Raise your hand if you're building with AI in your startup. Who is building AI with? I would say you know probably should say you know who is not. Huh? <laughs> um, obviously. AI is new, but also becoming very quickly commoditized. There's like a lot of platforms, and startups are using their APIs, introducing a lot of the same features. How are you thinking about differentiating yourselves in your category? So it's a, uh, we are differentiating ourselves not because of technology, but because of the user experience. Okay. So we are trying to create you know, such a powerful user experience so people really like have a you know, frictionless flow for creation. And if you can make it less friction, the better for the user. So that means you know, we are introducing AI tools. We're learning to our data. We are learning how our users are you know, using our product because we have such a big user base. So it's, uh, for us, it's easier to, to test uh, different hypotheses very quickly. So we are you know, providing you know, like powerful tools. We are testing them when we are removing frictions as we go. Yeah, we have other differentiators. We have a, you know, we have a community which, you know, contributing back to the big start. We have a very strong AI team. Actually, we have we built AI team for many, many, many years. It's a pretty large AI team. We bought GPUs last year. We have, you know, bought a pretty large cluster of GPUs. And so we are training our own models. So we are having our own models which are very function to our use case. Yeah, we understand. You know, you cannot compete with every model in the world, but you can make a model which is more fine-tuned to your uh, particular use case. And that's what we see as a differentiator, as a flywheel for us to you know, empower more of our users uh, and create something better, faster, and cheaper. So relatedly, how are you thinking about um, product market fit or for features, for example? How are you kind of getting the, the signal out of the noise from your users? Uh, good question. Uh, so multiple sources, right? You know, so we have founders here, so do you understand? We are, you know, we are looking at the existing user behavior, but it's not always an indicator of what they want, right? So uh, you know, uh, they will want some incremental improvements, but they will not really like, ask for radical improvements. So we need to really look. Are the competitors? We need to look at uh, all the new technologies which are, which are appearing. Uh, have our own way of you know innovating, like hackathons and all these engineers coming with new ideas. You know, our our they have about 800 people at Pixar, and everybody, almost everybody, is using Pixar. They are contributing back with ideas, etc. 
So, you know, we are collecting ideas from many places. And then what we do with these ideas, we rapidly test them. We rapidly test and we do, do A-B testing, so seeing this feature, that feature, and see which feature really you know, resonates. And if it doesn't resonate, we just replace with another feature. So rapid iteration, rapid testing, rapid experimentation, that was a kind of what's in our DNA for many, many years. That's how we started. When we started, we were launching a new version every week. Because it's the horizon stage, founders in the audience, what is your advice, your top advice for other entrepreneurs who are wading into AI? Right. So, OK, so f dear founders, entrepreneurs, yeah, I think take AI very seriously. That's what you know, we, I'll say. But also find out your own way of using it. There are two ways of using the AI today. One is uh, to improve your internal productivity, which is a huge, huge tool for in your hand. So you can improve like uh, engineering process, design process, graphics, and uh, marketing. So it could really automate lots of things for you. It could make you, your life so much easier. But also think about the value you can provide to your end users to, to, to AI. I believe everybody is using AI today. And AI will be like internet. So we call it ourselves sometimes it's an I'm AI company, I'm AI company, but it will be like internet. Nobody call uh, uh, their company anymore like I'm internet company because every company is internet company. So the same thing with AI. Every company will be AI company ultimately uh, because you are going to use AI. You are going to use the same way you use computers, the same way you use electricity, the same way you use the internet. You are going to use AI. So. The sooner the better, I would say. Uh, the more quicker you uh, embrace this technology, the better. Uh, the, yeah, the, then uh, I think it's an amazing time. It's an amazing time. It's also a scary time, I, honestly. I think it's a, it's a, it has a, some existential threat to many companies in, in a, here or in the near future. Uh, but it's also an opportunity. So you know, the longer you wait, there will be more an existential trend. And if you move sooner, it could be an opportunity. Any best practices? Should they be looking to open source first? Or how should they tackle that practically? I think that's, you know, uh, if you, like, for me, like, for if you really like leading edge, like, so right now, GPT-4 is the, the, the top pro product. No question. So you can use open source, but GPT-4 is still by far the best. But for other things, you can use open source things. You know, if you're using like coding, I still didn't see anything better than GPT for now. Uh, I hope there will be more competition. I hope looking forward to, for that. Uh, and other, I think that will be a great thing. So you can consider also training your own fine-tuned models based on uh, open source models. If you have a large data set, that will be your advantage to train your and fine-tuned data sets using the, the open source and your data sets. That could be like very good competitive advantage. But yeah, open source is a, is a big thing. I think mean, it's really like making so much accessible to entrepreneurs, to startups, to use this open source for free, almost for free, and launch products based on them. All right, let's do a couple of fun questions for the ending. What is your favorite way of using AI right now? Is there an app that you love using every day, other than Pixar? Obviously. You will be you know, laughing, but you know, I'm spending my last weekends uh, coding. I was doing my coding like, OK, 10 years ago, my last one. And now I just became like, again a fan of coding because it's so much fun. It's a, I feel like I can really like make a prototype like in minutes. Uh, and basically, then I show to my uh, product or engineering, not just a document, but actually even working prototype, which is a kind of very cool of way of communicating. Uh, and yeah, I really enjoy doing that. Uh, it's it's become my work much easier when you can show things working and it's okay, take it and continue, versus just writing a document, uh, which people still didn't understand how things work. And then finally, give me an AI prediction for 2024. I think the big thing for next year will be video. Uh, I think video is kind of like, you know, we are seeing first, first results, but 
I think next year will be a big boom of video production using AI, which could be very disruptive to the many industries, including, you know, like Hollywood and video production in general. I think video will be a very big thing, so, but also multi-modality, so intersection of different kind of formats uh, into one kind of, uh, you know, product and tools. Something to watch. Well, I think this is a great place to end. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys for being here with us. Thank you very much. Good luck. <laughs>